As someone pointed out, I get the postprandial session, so luckily I, I am armed with a cowbell in case I see anybody <laughs> snoozing up. <coughs> So I'm Eric Cutchinson. I'm one of the veterinarians at Johns Hopkins University um, and a co-organizer of this little shindig here. And speaking of self-indulgence, everybody who organizes a, a conference should get to speak at it, right? Assign themselves a speaking gig. Um, so I apologize for my own self-indulgence here, but um, we had tried to line up a couple people to give this talk, and when they declined, I gracefully volunteered. Um, so first off, I will say as I go through, I'm happy to answer questions or, or handle objections or uh, insults, um, which is a trait common to all born bull. So. They just like the internet, you know. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so who am I? So I actually started as a behavior person at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, this is me at the NICHD uh, field station in Poolsville uh, low many years ago. Um, demonstrating proper PPE usage, of course. <laughs> and this is me launching the good ship uh, monkey bars into a pond. Um, and so it wasn't till four years after this that I decided to go to vet school. So here's me um, practicing animal behavior uh, and not realizing that four years after I would, I would learn that that's actually a pooled monkey fecal sample that I'm standing in. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about some of the role that uh, veterinarians can have in social housing. Um, so there is a historical and regulatory role given to veterinarians in managing social housing. We're going to talk about that briefly. And then I am going to insult all my veterinarian colleagues um, by discussing why some of the reasons that veterinarians can sometimes become barriers to the social housing process. Um, and then I'm going to offer some suggestions for how veterinarians can avoid that, or how their friends can help veterinarians avoid that. <laughs> so the Animal Welfare Act actually um, sets the attending veter veterinarian up as the ultimate authority for a lot of things in an animal facility, and one of those is the behavior program. So the language pertinent to the psychological well-being of primates um, says that uh, the plan must be in accordance with the currently accepted professional standards as cited in appropriate professional journals or reference guides as directed by the attending veterinarian. Now that was a conscious choice and one that was not necessarily, um, that it, it could have gone other ways. Um, they could have mandated that every primate facility have a behaviorist. They could have done lots of things, um, but they didn't. They went with the attending veterinarian as the ultimate authority. and. We'll see, and you likely all know, that there's a, a wide range of facilities out there in terms of how involved a veterinarian is directly in the behavior program, how, whether or not there is a behavior staff even. Um, there are plenty of primate facilities, small primate facilities, that don't have a dedicated behavior staff where the veterinarian is the behaviorist. Um, and so by setting up this, this authority, um, the act did provide veterinarians with a lot of chance to promote social housing. So this is actually a picture of Victor Reinhardt, um, who was one of the um, most vocal proponents of social housing among veterinarians um, in and around the time of the 1985 amendment. And he and many others had an early recognition and impact of the impact of single housing on health. It was, um, it's been 60 years since Harlow first published the studies looking at single housing and its effect on infants and juveniles, but it wasn't in really until the amendments of 1985 and a lot of the work after that that um, the importance of social housing for monkeys for the sake of the monkeys was really kind of promoted into the field. And a lot of that work was, was promoted by veterinarians, including Catherine Bain, Victor Reinhardt, um, and then in some places where the veterinarian just recognized the need for behavior staff, like um, Michael Keeling at, at the, um, Bastrop Primate Center, bringing Molly Bloomsmith in very early. So veterinarians have had this kind of historical role in pushing forward social housing. Um, and there are lots of great examples of very integrated veterinary and behavior staffs. Kate actually works at a facility that is really kind of a shining beacon of integration for veterinary and behavior staffs. However, um, so I just got back from the Society of Primatology meeting where I gave a kind of version of this talk. 
And although there are very good examples of places where everything's working perfectly, the, the majority of the people that talked to me afterward would come up to express concern about how there's an adversarial relationship set up between veterinarians and behavior staff and how vets are sometimes seen as barriers to social housing and primate welfare in general. So how does that happen? So I'm gonna give you a little primer on how laboratory animal veterinarians are trained to be behaviorists. So first, we can all accept that laboratory animal veterinarians are not selected from a pool of overly gregarious people. <laughs> so you start with somebody who always got along better with animals. And then we take them to vet school and we give them one semester on behavior. I, in my one semester on behavior, at least one class was spent on whether or not feel away works. So then we have rather than a semester, a single class on monkeys. And in my recollection of that single class, it was basically a veterinarian saying the word herpes B over and over and over again. <laughs> and then we get off to our residency training. So we're off to learn how to be a laboratory animal vet. And you learn very quickly that being a laboratory animal vet is a specialty in being a generalist. So you're basically learning how there are all sorts of situations you're gonna see that literally nobody has ever seen before and you have to be able to guess, if not intelligently, at least overconfidently, um, in how to handle that situation. And then we take that person, we give them ultimate authority over animal welfare. And so the result of this is that <laughs> veterinarians <laughs> are released into the behavior world naked and afraid. So, the downsides of this, um, how this really manifests, is I think that, again, largely because of the system, the way it's set up, not necessarily the fault of their own, um, a lot of veterinarians approach behavior with the belief that you can figure it out. This is something, it's common sense. But as Kate actually hit on pretty perfectly, you can argue most situations either way with common sense. And it's until you, until you start looking at it, you don't really know how it's gonna come out. The other option is that you can, as a vet, recognize that behavior is very complex, impossible to grasp in one afternoon of reading journals, and so you give up. And then I think the problem there is that you become overly deferent to PIs, many of which have a lot of expertise in their specific field. Some of them are behaviorists themselves, but don't necessarily, aren't necessarily given the authority or task to care for the animal's welfare itself versus their own research. I also think we end up as veterinarians sometimes in such fear of getting the medicine wrong that we forget about attending to behavior as its own contributor to health. And we end up, again, as veterinarians with a reliance on anecdote or superstition in many cases where if you're only gonna see something hap once or twice in your career, it's very hard not to become superstitious about it. And I'll talk about that a little later. So I'm going to watch, this is your, your quiz portion. It's worth 120 points. Um, so we're gonna go through a few scenarios. These are scenarios that I actually have personal experience with, with veterinarians. Um, and I'm gonna give you, you're gonna tell me the worst possible way that a veterinarian could handle these scenarios. And I'm gonna tell you that that's how they were handled in these specific cases. All right, so a veterinary technician comes to the veterinarian and says, we have these two monkeys that are paired but one of them is losing weight because the other is eating all the biscuits and treats. So what's the obvious worst thing that the vet could then do? Separate. Separate them. Well, that's easy to fix. Separate them. Clearly this is a bad pair because one is losing weight and the other one's gaining weight. Well, as behavior people, behavior oriented people, again, this is me preaching to the choir. I really, I should be going out and speaking at AVMA and giving this lecture, but, um, you all know that a dominance hierarchy is set up to where a lot of times one animal will get a lot of biscuits or a lot of food and the other animal will get less food. Um, and so there are other ways to handle this that we'll get to later. How about another scenario? Uh, the same vet tech comes in at Friday at 3.30 and says, one of the five monkeys in that gang cage has diarrhea but we don't know which one. So what does the vet do? What, what does our, our bad vet do? They separate them all so you can figure out who has diarrhea. And who will have diarrhea tomorrow if you separate all five monkeys? <laughs> all five monkeys will have diarrhea. 
All right, so a vet is faced with the probably getting close to undeniable truth that unrelated adult male rabbits often fight viciously when socially housed. So what's the, what's the answer to that? So we'll never, we will never pair rabbits, right? That's of course the answer to adult male rabbits often fight viciously when socially housed. Um, and that, I think, is something that OLA is facing um, as they're going around, ALAC is facing, USDA is facing, is that there is this obvious worst case scenario and people are overgeneralizing from that. Um, this was, this is, I'm actually only gonna bring this up because Molly Bloomsmith made me chuckle when she told, told, reminded us of this last time, is that anytime somebody says that three strikes and you're out, you should wonder if baseball had four strikes, would we allow four attempts before we stop doing it? <laughs> Much like if you're looking at a, a numbers justification and it's a base 10 number, you should be very suspicious. We need 10 mice, to, it needs to be 20 mice. Um, all right, so this is one that is near and dear to my heart because it launched a, a research project that I did. So about 10 years ago, an investigator at Johns Hopkins proposed to treat juvenile rhesus with ADHD drugs to see how it affects their behavior later in life. We will be doing extensive cognitive testing and we need to singly house them for testing purposes and to make sure they are taking their drugs. And what's the worst thing that the vet can do when faced with that? Okay. And so what happened was these animals were separated for the purpose of getting their drugs and doing cognitive testing. And seven years later, they found that there was no effect of the drug that they gave. However, in looking back at the data myself, I found that the severity of self-injurious behavior that every single one of them developed correlated very well with their cognitive testing um, outcomes. So they ended up not with a drug model, but with a self-injurious behavior model. So how can vets and their friends make sure that the vets aren't barriers to social housing. I think there are some good solid steps that we can take. So first of all, again, the caveat is that context matters. There's a range of facility sizes, the species they house. A lot of you don't have primates at your facilities. There's a range of what constitutes a behavior staff from very fleshed out, multi-people staffs with uh, a PhD behaviorist leading them to no behavior staff where it's just one, the vet that is the behavior staff unto him or herself. There are also many facilities, um, including, uh, I just said that, yeah. okay. <laughs> All right, so one of the things that I think is most important is communication with PIs. And this is something, again, because of that situation with the, the monkeys and the ADHD drugs is near and dear to my heart in that an ounce of prevention is worth a thousand pounds of cure in this case. If you can prevent single housing, um, a single housing justification, especially in juvenile animals, um, you can save yourself from a lot of heartache later. So developing animals, if you're going to singly house a developing animal, we as veterinarians have the utmost responsibility to make sure that, that just, there's no way around that, literally no creative solution to, to fixing that problem because the consequences of that later on are devastating, especially in animals that are gonna be around chronically. If you're gonna take a juvenile animal, and I don't just mean monkeys, a juvenile animal of any type during its development and singly house it, it is going to be significantly altered as, as an adult. And I think that's part of our job as veterinarians to educate the PIs about how the unintended consequences of single housing can actually affect their research. And it's not like this is a field in its infancy here. Um, Victor Reinhardt, again, in the 80s was publishing on um, social housing and its effects on cortisol. We know the effects of social housing and single housing on the immune system via cortisol. There are a lot of systems that can be affected in a, in a bad way with single housing. The other thing that we need to do as veterinarians is to keep current regarding how the field handles special cases. And I think head caps is a good, situ a good um, example of this. And also why I put current in quotes because again, there was a 2004 report on social housing of head-capped macaques that seems to have gone mostly ignored until this most recent version of the guide kind of could put the, the spurs of the horse here and everybody is looking back at, at head-capped animals. There was just a discussion on comp med and lo and behold, my director who's been at Hopkins for 40 years 
forwarded that comp med discussion to all our head cap investigators and said, you guys need to be, need to do this. So, you know, <laughs> things can change. Um, so where vets are the behavior staff, I think this is really hard. Um, I think the vets that are their own behavior staffs need to recognize that behavior is an entire field. It's not just an organ system. It's not like, okay, I'm just going to go learn about the kidney today and then I'm going to know what, what, how to handle behavior. Um, so you have to make a real effort to educate yourself. And that's going to involve seeking out resources that vets aren't used to using. So it's not just going to be a PubMed search. Um, I think AWIC is actually an excellent resource here. Um, the Society of Primatologists. There are other forums in addition to CompMed that are very useful here, including LARF. Um, the other thing that I think vets without a dedicated behavior staff really should consider doing is get a bit dedicated behavior staff. Even if it's not going to be hiring a PhD behaviorist, just having someone on your staff who you say, I want you to implement this program, I want you to be thinking about this program, that's a good check on yourself. So somebody to to question your assumptions about separating an animal or um, to point out that, hey, we aren't social housing, socially housing any of our pigs that are coming in, that sort of thing. It really helps to have somebody whose job it is to be looking after the program that isn't also being asked to do a thousand other things. The other thing that we really need to do as vets, and this is really apropos in all situations, is to recognize the new quote unquote new dogma that social housing is the default. And remember what default means. There has to be a reason not to do it if you don't want to do it. So those vets that have a dedicated behavior staff, one of the best things that I think that we did at Hopkins was actually start to integrate our behavior staff into our clinical rounds. It just allows for such easy communication about the sorts of things that can lead to animosity between behavior staffs and veterinary staffs about having to separate an animal for diarrhea management or treatment or that sort of thing. And to have a behavior person there who can pipe in and say, well, actually, we could do it this way. Or to have somebody answer a question when we say, OK, we had three finger wounds in this group. We can say, OK, what's going on with that group, Sarah? And then Sarah pipes up and says, oh, well, they've had a lot of fighting, and we're, working at, we're doing this to try and manage it. It's, it's opened up a, um, a wider array of communication than we ever had before. And so I highly recommend that if you have a place where the veterinary and behavior staffs are separate. I also think it's important that we recognize the level of expertise of the behavior staff. So in some cases, again, that's a PhD, PhD level scientist. We need to recognize as veterinarians that that person knows more about behavior than we do. Um, the other thing is if somebody's worked on a problem for a week, even if they don't have a PhD education and you ask them, to summarize, you should probably listen to them. We, I, I will put this on me. I oftentimes like, oh, well, we could do that. Well, this person has worked a week on this and probably considered every scenario that I just popped into my head in the last 30 seconds and has reasoning for it. So we really need to listen to the reasoning for their decisions. And then I think the ultimate thing is we need to remember that the attending veterinarian is given authority over, this, over these programs. So. It's, it's not really appropriate to just hand over all of, all of the behavior decision making to even a dedicated behavior staff. But at the same time, it's imperative upon us to wield that authority in an informed way. So we need to be seeking out all the input we can get from the behavior staff and then using that to inform our decisions. All right, so now some specific examples. One is planning socializations. So I think it's very important. The planning that you put into a socialization is going to be directly related to its likelihood of success. And one of the best um, measures of this, I think Kate already hit on, which is setting realistic expectations and discussing criteria for removal. One of the biggest determinants of whether a pair is going to be successful or not is how much tolerance the veterinarian has for a wound. And so. I think that it's very important that we set a realistic criteria. And if you have a vet that needs to suture every single wound, at least know that going in and try and figure out some way to, to manage that. But at the same time, if you're going to be, for instance, a primate vet and you insist that every monkey should have 10 fingers and 10 toes, you're going to spend a lot of time very disappointed. 
The other thing to keep in mind as veterinarians is that interventions beget interventions. So as soon as you go into a group and pull an animal out, you're setting up that group for a much higher degree of difficulty in remaining successful. It goes for pairs the same way. As soon as you go into a pair and knock an animal down to sew it back up, you're hurting the chances that that pair is gonna succeed. Now that doesn't mean that that's not the decision that's appropriate, but we need to, we need to always be cognizant that intervening comes with cost. And then we also need to recognize that sometimes failures happen. Um, so when a socialization goes bad, I think it's important to do a postmortem. Um, hopefully not an actual postmortem, but uh, a metaphorical one, and discuss the possible reasons and, wait, and the things that went wrong, what we could have done differently. Um, but also recognize that, you know, even the people that are doing this best are getting a success rate of 70% or 75%. Well, that's 25 to 30% that failed. Um, and so you should expect that you will have failures, especially if you're a program that's trying to launch a social housing program from scratch. You should not probably expect to reach 70 and 75% success because these things are difficult to get, get your hands around. Um, so until you're practiced at it and good at it, it's probably going to be closer to 50. Um, the other thing to remember as vets, and this, again, I am definitely guilty of this, is that the plural anecdote is not data. So um, this, this, this is a, a brief look into the psyche of a veterinarian. So this is, the this is a typical course of primate diarrhea. It's a little better, a little worse, and then a little better, and then a little worse, and then a little better, and then a little worse. And as veterinarians, I take this point and I give it probiotics, for instance, and then it gets better. And then it got a little worse. But from now on, every monkey that I see that has diarrhea is going to get probiotics. So how come when one animal goes bad, we never do socializations again? Like, I feel like diarrhea, we, we treat everything with this blind optimism. Oh, this thing might have done something maybe one time, so I'll give it 100 times more before I'm convinced that it doesn't work. Whereas with primates, primate socializations, oh, we've tried this thing 90 times, and it worked 80, 80 of them, and, but then these 10 went really bad, so I'm never going to do that again. It just seems like we, if we're going to form superstitions, at least be optimistic superstitions. Come on. Um, however, the alternative to superstitions is using evidence. Uh, one thing is veterinarians at laboratory animal medicine training programs fall into the trap of is using PubMed and using PubMed alone. And that is missing a lot of the pertinent behavior journals. Um, so it's best to use uh, a multi-database search or use um, some of the services that are willing to do searches for you, so one of which is sponsoring this, uh, this event. Um, or use, make sure that you're using ones that you know pick behavior journals, like Web of Science. However, there are lots of places where evidence isn't available or doesn't match your situation perfectly. We heard why you shouldn't necessarily generalize from one species of macaque even to another. So in those cases, you do have options. You can use natural histories to inform decisions. Um, I also think you should be cautiously optimistic. So if you can't find any evidence on whether or not somebody has paired sooty mangabees, for instance, you shouldn't conclude then that you shouldn't pair sooty mangabees. Um, if there's no evidence available, you should be prepared to be the one to produce the evidence. The other thing that vets, I think, um, this is actually one of the best things, I think, about the Animal Welfare Act is the exemptions clause, because it really forces veterinarians to question their own assumptions. Um, every 30 days, if you have written an exemption, you need to look at it again and say, yes, I still think that this animal needs to be exempt. And I, as a veterinarian, sometimes think that that's a huge hassle and it's a pain in my butt and um, it's a paperwork burden and all of that. But it, it needs to be used as an exercise to question yourself, not just a signature on a piece of paper. Um, you need to know the regulations. You need to know what qualifies for an exemption. You should develop a way to discuss and record exemptions with the behavior staff if you have one. And you should build flexibility into your SOPs and environmental enrichment plans. This is more an enrichment note than a socialization note, but for instance, if your enrichment plan doesn't allow for three days of bananas instead of a nut, a nut treat and then a frozen 
treat and then then you're not building enough flexibility into your plan. You shouldn't need an exemption to, to switch up enrichment for a couple days. And then the other thing is to be realistic about priorities. So it's, it's more important to get an animal socially housed than, again, to make sure that it gets, that it, uh, that every animal in an enclosure gets the banana treat that you're handing out to everybody. They're much happier being socially housed, even if, they, if not every single animal gets the treat. All right, so now we're gonna go through our scenarios again and come up with, this is now your team project for 90 points. Um, the best case scenario. So now we're gonna come up with what the good vet would do. All right, these monkeys are paired, but one of them is losing weight because the other is eating all the biscuits and the treats. What would we do? What are some ideas? What's that? That's excellent. That's good work. <laughs> That's not even what I had considered. <laughs> Find out if it's true. Weigh the animal. See if it's actually losing weight. That's a great idea. How about, what did you say? Maybe. Yeah. Oh, um, so, well, I think somebody else said it, but I was going to say it. Um, <laughs> Exactly. So you could just separate them for feeding. Yeah, exactly right. The other thing is space feeders. Yes. So cooperative feeding. You can do training specifically for cooperative feeding to get the animals to, to get the dominant animal to allow the submissive to, to eat. Um, and the, a lot of how, which one of the, yes, go ahead. Um, so there, are, yes. Um, I would check to see what they're actually doing. I mean, like one of, one of the most important things in behavioral management is watching the animals. And um, so, like you said, check the weight, but check whether the food really is being stolen or is it being given. You know what's going on. And um, those of you who want to do this, one of the best ways to do it. I couldn't agree more. Cameras are one of the most important tools for, for any sort of behavior assessment. And actually, that, that hits on this, this actual scenario that I actually dealt with, where the vet did have them all separate, did have the animals separated, and then I made them put, put them back together and figure out what was going on. When we socially housed <coughs> the animals, the caretaker, the animals used to get, for instance, seven biscuits apiece, and then we paired the animals, and so then the cage got seven biscuits. And so one of the animals was losing weight, predictably. Um, so it wasn't until we did our due diligence that we figured out what had gone wrong. Um, but it certainly wasn't because it was a bad pair, right? You wouldn't think that that was because of a bad pair. Um, so it took, it took some sleuthing to figure out what, what exactly had happened. Um, but it's, it's important to work these through and not just knee jerk to, it's a bad pair, it's over. All right, one of the five, we've already discussed this. You're gonna give them all diarrhea if you separate them out. Um, monkey diarrhea comes and goes. At the very least, wait till tomorrow and see if there is still diarrhea. And if there isn't, maybe reconsider whether you're gonna intervene. Um, and if there, is, if there is one animal that has diarrhea, you can, get, you can get at that without separating them. It doesn't take long for an animal with diarrhea to produce diarrhea. So if you just stand there, you will find out which animal has diarrhea. Preferably with a mask on. Um, unrelated adult male rabbits often fight viciously when socially housed. So in this one, I think the, the problem itself is kind of self-refuting in that we have to add adult, we have to add male, and we have to add often before this is a true statement. So there are lots of ways to, to house rabbits that are appropriate that don't come close to violating this. For instance, I work at a facility, I consult a facility where the rabbits they use never reach purity before they're used. So we bring in male rabbits and socially house them all the time because they come in as juveniles and they go out the back door as juveniles. And so they never live their lives singly housed because they never reach the age where it's a problem. Lots of facilities have female rabbits. Female rabbits can be socially housed. It takes some work. 
it's hard to get them established. But once they're established, they can usually live in a normal legal cage for two rabbits. We're not going to do that one. <laughs> All right. We propose to treat juvenile rhesus with ADHD drugs. We want to singly house them to do it. This is one where the vet has to intervene and say, this is not appropriate. If you are going to do behavior studies in an animal as an adult that are supposed to be informed by a drug treatment, there's no way that those animals can be raised singly housed and expect to get valid scientific results. Um, there has to be some common sense here. There has to be some give and take. And this is partly why the attending vet is given a role on the eye cook, right? I mean, this is, this is a place where the attending vet should speak up and say to the eye cook, there, there isn't a way for this to make sense. We've got to find a, a way around this. And there are ways around this. How, how could you deal with this? One of the ways would be to separate them for the dosing only and for the cognitive testing. Only. Yes. And in some cases, that can be done without even disrupting the pair or separating them from the same cage. But something that, I, that has occurred to me over and over, and I think probably has been stated, is we really need to have environments that are designed to do what it is you're trying to do. And the more flexible those environments are, the greater flexibility you can have in managing the animals and conducting the science. Agreed. And I think that that's one thing where cage design actually has made a big improvement in the ability to work through some of these problems. Um, cage designs where you can separate and, and pair animals very easily and quickly allow s for so much more flexibility in terms of separating for half an hour for dosing or separating just for the cognitive testing. Um, the, the cages where you just have the slide panel that, that comes in and out and opens the ha back half of the cage. Um, I think those are a great advancement in being able to do that. Our caging at Hopkins is one of those where you have to you have to open the door, you have to grab the cage and the, the barrier, pull it out, it weighs 5,000 pounds, and you have to get, but as our caging gets better, these solutions are gonna be a lot easier. Um, and I think in retrospect, the scientist that did this study really has regrets about the way they designed the study, and it's too late. All right, that's it, I'm done. Um,